of you. Thank you for the intro. I don't need any more. I'm thrilled to talk about art. I have to be honest. When people say to me, who are your 10 favorite artists? I give them 100 names because there are no 10 favorite artists of mine. I like so many artists. What I tried to do today is um, I love New York in the summer. It's a very different experience than being here during the auctions. When there are auctions, you have blockbuster shows. So the auction periods are, and we're going to do them again, which thank God we do every year now, from September through, it's really October, November, you're going to have the big name shows, high, high volume, you'll see a ton of people there. And then you have, again, April, right after tax season, after the 15th of April through June, again, insane, because so many people come to New York to buy. Um, if we were in San Francisco, this month is a very hot month because a lot of people come to San Francisco for vacation and there are a lot of art collectors that do that. So each city has a different important time for art. The reason I love doing these tours in the this period of time is I can take you to a few galleries that are not the biggest name galleries, but some of them specialize in different things. And at this time of the year, you are going to get great shows there. So we're seeing two shows with Tanya Bonacard Gallery and three shows at Pace Gallery. One of the sh and, and Pace has its own huge building now, and they have another smaller building. So they show contemporary and also famous estates. The most famous estate they have is the Rothko estate. And they also have Tony Smith. We're going to see Tony Smith today. So let's get started. And what I try and do in these lectures is I've become, I'm in love now with teaching online. I still take groups in person to galleries, which is a different experience because we can have more of a dialogue. And, and But I don't want you to be shy. I will try and look at your questions on the chat. But the reason I love doing it online is you can actually hear videos, which I can't do for people in person. So the videos are the big perk for these classes. So we're going to start with two different shows. Now, what I find fascinating is how galleries decide when they have more than one exhibition on. It's usually on another floor. But you try and make it interesting that if somebody comes in knowing one artist, they're going to get excited about the other. So if you're, you're going to see these two gallery shows and you're going to understand yourself. I might tell you if you don't, anyone doesn't write it in the chat, but you'll see that there's a really interesting thread between the two shows. Now, when I give you this, you're going to get this uh, at the end. I am very neurotic. My mother likes to say, she always said, don't say you're neurotic, say you're very precise and organized. You can say it any way you want. But I want you to see the press releases. I want you to see the videos. And then I want you to see the work and the installations. Why do I show you that all? Because part of the experience is not the individual piece, but how they work well together. So let's start with the video. We always show the video first to give you like a taster's choice of the artist. And hopefully you'll get interested. So this is a beautiful video. This was done for Lehigh. It's two minutes and 18 seconds. And you're going to see, you're going to watch this. The music is great too. Ari's going to start it right now. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it'll be 12 days, consistent days working on this generally about 11 hours each day, yeah. Walls can be um, barriers, walls could be protecting. Everyone could have a personal feeling about what a wall is, be it personal, be it culturally, be it in terms of um, your community. Yes, on one level it's superficial, but clothing, we do imbue them with meaning. They kind of help to define who we either are or want to be seeing in the world. So they do have resonance 
Car cover is about like a thing that has value, a thing that's precious, a thing of privilege. And I'm putting that up against, you know, these shoes that were worn by people who have, who are, have, there's more value and more to that. But what does it mean to put these things together? Like what's the value of a life with the other objects that we protect? But maybe that car cover is also in a weird way a protector of those bodies and those souls. So I was thinking about our culture that's both impoverished and excess. You know, there's some items of clothing here that are tattered where you start to think, why did someone think someone else would want this? But then other things that are brand new. So you think about the, just kind of the excess of our culture that there's some things here that had the original tags still on them, you know? It has different entry points, be them personal, political, but they're, I'm hoping it can reflect the complexity of, of, of our human existence. This is maybe particularly American culture, we could start with that, and then the complexity of just being human. All right, so why do I show you this to start with? Because I'd like you to hear about her in her own voice. Um, I hope you found her interesting. I think she's brilliant. She's quite young. And now this is the show that she has on now. So let me explain something to you. Every artist, I'm included in that, does a show and then he or she or they work on to the next project. So the project we're going to see at the museum now is different than that show. But I wanted you to understand how her mind works. So the thing that I find interesting is she is not doing art for art's sake. Her work is quite political. I'm sure you realize that. She's talking about access. She's talking about poverty. She's talking about the fact that some people can drive a car and some people have to walk everywhere. Some people can take public transit. This installation of the show that she has on now, I find brilliant. So now let's go to the gallery. And you'll see what she does is she mixes different things. So she'll have, I want you to see the space. We're going to walk through the space. Ari's going to show us the five images of the installations. So you see there's a lot of blank space around the gallery. That's not an accident. In the back room, there's a video. But you'll see that there's a photograph against a mirror. There are pieces of driftwood in here. There, you're seeing all different ways of thinking of what an art object is. There's a photograph that's leaning in, in, in powder. Um, and it's all about how you perceive what you're seeing and what it's meant to do. So let's keep going to the next one. Now, that's my favorite piece in there. It's a piece of driftwood. And there's a photograph sitting on top. of. We're going to see all the images, so don't worry. I just wanted you. Now, that to me is amazing. Any of you who live in New York, I'm curious, Ari, I'm going to ask, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have those orange things in California too when they're building things or not? Marion says yes. I, oh, don't rec I don't recall seeing too many, but I don't see too many construction sites. Maybe Marion drives around to the construction sites in the area. I don't oh, know. So what's fascinating to me is you look at it and you say like, oh my God, is that art? And I would say, yes, that is art because they're building a wall. And you think about people like Saul LeWitt who paints on a wall, or you think about um, uh, Donald Judd who does very beautiful. And don't be upset if you don't know names. I'm throwing it out. So if you want to learn more, you'll learn more. And if not, my father always said the reason he loved Rav Soloveitchik was that Rav Soloveitchik spoke on one level. And then if you knew more, you knew more. I'm not saying I'm Rav Soloveitchik, but I'm saying I try and throw out as much information that those of you who want more will get more. So what's interesting in here, there are little microphones and you hear the sound of building. And the video goes on of construction sites. So let's go to see the individual um, pieces where it says works. Or you go to where it says works and we'll see each individual piece. In the same um, yeah, website? Yeah, it's on the on... top of the page. Yep, you'll go back to the page and you press on works. This is Ari's first time doing this. Now you go to works right there on the top. Works, 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 works. Now the other side, down underneath, there it is. Now next to press release. No, 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 go up again next to, there it is. Now, 
I feel like now you press on that and it'll get to be big and they show you a blow up and you can see it. And I want to hear from you and then go to the next one. There's another one they show you because these are done for people who might purchase it. You see it from close and then from far. Now, thank you. You're the best. You can see, you can see what that is now. That's that paper that when you pack things, that paper's in there. So you'll say to me, Toby, why does she have to put that in there? Why does she have a photograph together with aluminum and then that? And why don't one of you answer me so that I'm not the only one talking? Anyone want to tell me why you think that's done? So it says here, photograph, photo on canvas, cardboard packing material, mirrored plexiglass and wood. So what do you think she's trying to say since you saw the video of hers before? What is she trying to tell you? I'm going to say something if nobody answers, but I don't mind hearing. Can we unmute people all right, so they can just speak spontaneously if they want? It's possible, but people can chat as well. And I see people putting stuff in the chat. Oh, right there now. it is. Capturing the land. Yay, you. Good shot. Love that. Capturing the land. So you're, you're so correct. Um, it's capturing the land, but it's also saying you're capturing a moment. In other words, I am trying to get you to be in that moment and understand in conceptual terms, I'm packaging my memory, which I love. Framing poverty, that's right too. Very good. Natural versus person made. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Beautiful. I love you all. Let's go to the next image. And that's going to be even, I think, even stronger. So this says driftwood. Whoops. You'll see the driftwood. It says, always look at what it's made. Driftwood, uh, man and boat. Um, and it's, um, it's a print, a Sienna print. So you're seeing, let's see the print in the third picture. You'll see it. All right. Can it, says, you get uh, it? it says steel driftwood Sintra print. Yes. Look at the Sintra print. You'll see the third picture has that. No, 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 right there, yeah. So, you tell me what that's about. It's a print of a man. Is this a very wealthy person? No, I hope you realize that. There's a lot going on. Trees are made into objects. You are correct. Um, and what's so powerful is we go, or many of us go to the beach and see driftwood and say, oh my God, isn't that powerful? but you're not realizing this is a, 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 a poor person who's adrift and trying to get things back to his, where he is. So it's conceptually making you think about all the people that are displaced. Um, drift would we look at and we say how beautiful it is. We think of the beach and we think about everything, but then you see the photograph and you say, wow, the beach is also how uh, immigrants try and come into a new country. What she's trying to do is showing you that even when you enjoy something as beautiful as just being on the beach, that the beach means different things. And it could be an, it can be a, a trigger for trauma. Um, I always think of the movie Exodus when the boats were turned away from in, in Haifa. I just want you to understand that the reason I admire this artist so much is that there's, you can see very different things and experience. When you see it from far away, it just looks like this gorgeous piece of driftwood. And you see the photograph and then you say, wow, it's not any about what I'm thinking. And that's why I think she's a great artist. Let's go to the next one. Very powerful piece as well. And this is Grief and Loss. Uh, and it's archived photograph on drywall and metal studs and sandbags. So when you look at this image, it's not a standard photograph. There's many things going on. And she is trying to get you to go into an experience. Now, somebody I'm hoping is thinking to themselves, wow, this reminds me of a Cornell box. And I'd say 5,000 points for you. Because what Cornell was doing with his famous Cornell boxes was 
he was showing you a small box. I hope many of you know Cornell is one of my favorite artists. He did it on small scale and he would put different things together to make you think about things. And here she's putting together an image that's telling you a story and you're understanding um, what really is happening here. That sometimes you see things and it makes you go to another place. Now, I would love to hear from you. Um, how many of you find her work compelling? You've only seen a few of them yet, but you're already seeing that she's sh making you see something and think about what sandbags do if there's a flood, think about destruction, thinks about the environment, think about many different cultures, thinking about that many people are coming from one culture and live in another. And now today, it's really not the right thing to say when you meet somebody for the first time, where do you come from? Because that makes you an insider and them an outsider. So you say, where did you live last? Or some, you have to think of a way to say it that it's not about insider and outsider. Hey, Toby, in case I miss that, it, there was a question. Did you tell us about her background, this artist, how old she's they are and where 30. they live? And, and kind well, of where they I want to do me a favor. You're going to do me a favor, Ari, since this is the first time you were in doing it together. Let's go to the press release because that's an excellent question. And in the press releases, we're going to go back to her first page. And I want you to see in the press release, can you go back to the, on the same page, it says press release. Some galleries, the press releases are very stock full of sales information. But in here, can you go back to it, Ari? And you'll see, go back, go back on the original page. Go back to the page. There it is. Underneath there, it says, there it is. Um, let me go right here. Olivia was a long career of work in the realm of public art, um, but you'll see where she was born. Um, go up a little further. Um, sites right here. She was born in uh, Tobago in 68. I'm really happy that somebody asked. And now, from now on, all of you wonderful people in my class, I think it's very important that you read this only after you see the work. Why do I say that? Because it's important for you to understand the visual aspect of the art before you see all the other stuff. She's very, uh, she's very famous, as you can see. She's shown all over the place. So if you like my class, uh, these programs that we do together, then I want you to look at all this afterwards. I don't want to spend too much time on her history because I want you to look at the art for the art's sake, but always look at these after you've seen the work. All right, you'll see this is, um, some press releases are too much about infomercials, this is not. But thank you for looking at that. Now let's go, I love that fourth one. Let's go to that one. That to me is so profound. So this is um, Transparent's photo on plexiglass, tinted sand and steel. And tell me what you think of when you see this. Now, every artist, every artist relates to other artists. And if you know the artist um, by the name of, um, uh, who did Spiral Jetty, Robert Smithson, who's done pieces that are similar, if you've seen him at Dia Foundation. So she is playing with this, image in sand and tell me what you think about when you see this do you understand she doesn't want the art piece to be a piece on the wall she wants you to walk around it feel what's happening sometimes she photo prints on translucent material you can see some of the blue behind it so the image is there but it's more translucent different when then she prints it on aluminum so what does it make you think of? Again, idea of reality. I, I love that. Oh, ideal versus reality. Very good. You're right. What else? I mean, doesn't it feel a certain amount of loneliness and the chairs are on the ground? I think I saw this right before Tishabov, and on Tishabov, many people sit on the floor and this would have been a perfect thing for that, about loss, about displacements. So uh, I think this is a very powerful piece. I gave a lecture in the gallery 
on Tisha B'Av and I, I wasn't working with Jewish people. So I just said, in many cultures, we mourn the fact of loss and we're close to the ground. And I think there's something very powerful about that. Let's go to the next one. Now, somebody would say to me, these works are beautiful, but who the heck would buy it? There are people that do. I want to skip to uh, that one again. It's beautiful. Look at that. Um, that powers of 10. I mean, you know what? I, I realize we have so many shows I want you to see. Um, I, I want to talk a little more about this, but then you can look at this on your own. But she did a video in the back room. Um, and in that back room, that last image is part of the video she did. And through these orange things, you hear the noise of building. So um, I just wanted you to realize that some of them are more beautiful and some are less obviously beautiful. But in here, you can see where the speakers are. Go back to the lighthouse one, because that's such a beautiful, that one right now, up uh, one row up over to the corner, it says here, no, no, that row, there it is. So um, this is a photo on canvas and a light pad. And you can see that sometimes her works are very poignant and sometimes they're very large, but there's something she always, I think, is showing you beauty. And you see there's a photograph on the side um, that you see on the corner of the piece and this is, is the overhang of a building. So she's juxtapositioning different works to make you feel a certain way. And there is the um, light. Anyway, so I, I think we have to go to the next person because I'm just realizing I'm nervous. I'm spending too much time on each artist. I hope you like to work. And if you do, go back and look at it all. But again, she is very different than anyone else we're seeing today because her works are not made for most collectors. Why do I say that? Because they don't fit on the wall. Now we're going to go upstairs and you're going to say to me, oh my God, Toby, these are so much more powerful and beautiful. I don't agree with you but I think they're powerful and beautiful in a different way. But let's go to the next upstairs. I thought both shows had great power to them. And now we're seeing Dana Powell. You it's want you want to start with there's um video, the video. Because I think everyone's going to be blown away by how gorgeously she articulates painting. Um, I think the video though is embedded. Okay, I see where it is. Well, hmm. So I'm going to talk while you, you find it. Yeah, you, you, understand. I'm just telling you, you sent me a thing that says video, but it's actually a piece called Filthy Dreams. And it's, I don't know if that's, that's what I got as the video. Yeah, that's fine. I know which one it is. Yeah. Okay. You talk and I'll get it. I'll get it. All right. Out. So what I want to say, is she does tiny little paintings. They're this big. They're maybe eight by 10, 11 by 14. And they're beautifully articulated either on, on linen or on canvas. And they're just beautiful um, images. Oh, there you got it. You got the right thing. It's embedded in there. Oh, you got that. So now go down, and you'll see the video on further down. There it is. There it is. You got it. You're a genius, David Lynch. I'm walking. Oh my God! It wasn't blocked. See if you can get it now. There it is. There it is. Beautiful. We're not going to see the whole as I do. They're very small but you'll understand how her mind works. And my, my big thing about showing art is pulling the things next to each other and saying, wow, now I see what he's talking about. So let's, so that's how big the gal, the, the, you see the gallery's huge and that's how small the images are. I hope you're impressed with how much wall space they're giving to each of these tiny little paintings. And you, they do this with a person standing there so you see how actually small they are. And do I think they would look as good if they were large? No, I don't. So now let's look at the individual pieces. You got an inkling. Now go back upstairs where it says works right there in the corner. You're knowing the whole trick now, Ari. Now I feel like crying. My favorite one, and if you want to buy me a present, it's the fourth one in, but Look at these. This is called Wolf Moon. That's my favorite. The fourth one in uh, Snow Moon. I, 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 it's so tiny. Press on that. I, I love that so much. Can you press on it so we can get to see it 
Look at that. Oh my God, do I love that. It's oil and linen. It's six, it's six inches. Can you see how the paint, it looks like it's a photograph, but the, re <clears throat> the reason it's so mesmerizing is that it's painted so thin. Um, and you feel the fact that the moon is not totally there. It's eight inches by six inches. Now, when you, thank you, our God, you're so good at this. You see up close, you see, you can see translucency in the clouds. Let's go back to the first one. I want to spend a few minutes on these because I just love them. Um, go to the, go back. Now, yeah, that's a gorgeous. Each one of these are just beautifully painted pieces. Oh, you know what everyone's going to love? Go to the egg. That egg is beautiful. And feels like you're floating. I so agree with you. But can you press, look at that. Oh my God. I hope you all understand. This is a beautiful painting. Um, and why do I like it so much more than it if it was a photograph? Because you see the personality of the egg. And what do I mean by the personality of the egg? You see the way the liquid is moving. And I'm not saying it wouldn't be good as a photograph, but you feel the shell, you feel the inside of the shell. Uh, it's just, to me, very, very emotional, very much like in the video, you're driving on a road. I don't drive on roads a lot because I live in New York, but there's something mesmerizing about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm her big fan. Go to the other one. There's another beautiful on that second row. I want you to go back and look at this all on your own. Now go back to the second or the third one, factory fire. Look at that. So I did a show, it seems peaceful, you're right. Um, is she painting from photographs? Yes, good questions. I, Ari, thank you for opening up the chat for me. I, I, I do better when I see what people are asking. Um, now, why do I find this so interesting? Because I believe that fire is terrible. Um, but what I do love is that she understands that certain things might be horrible, but that are very beautiful to look at. Now, as a little kid, my mother always told me, I'll never forget this. When God forbid there's an accident on the highway, my mother said, don't stop and stare because it's somebody's private moment and you're infringing on their space. But in a factory fire like this, it's very important that you document it. Do you understand the difference between the two? And I, I think this is very profound, especially about the fires that I know going on in Canada and in California. I think this says so much. Different experience if it's a photograph and different experience if it was very large. Why, if it's very large, would it be different? I don't know if you know who Goya is. I love Goya and the famous pieces he did about uh, government overstepping their bounds. Uh, I think these are about interior feeling and the person who said she was a cook and she related to that let's look at the other ones hey but before we go on there was a question for you as an artist yeah how hard is it to paint things that seem so simple like <laughs> like a cloud or like a fire is that like a very challenging technical thing to do is this person like on a different plane no, is it excellent question. Excellent question. So let me explain to you something. And I'm so happy with the question. Um, by the way, Ari, I want, I always used to say that to everyone. I like the comment. I do a better lecture if you ask a question than I can answer right away. So a good artist, and I would say any artist that's worth their soul, has to learn the mechanics of making a good painting. Whether they do it all the time or not is not so important to me. What makes the painting good is what you choose to leave in and what you choose to leave out. So why do I like these so much? Because everything in the piece is there for a reason. And I'm going to bring in from the other room after the next video. I give all my students in foundation painting a small piece of cardboard with a square cut out in it. So that when you look into it, it's called like a viewfinder. You get to figure what is the important part. So what makes this painting so profound is what's left out and what's left in. So is it harder to do this? No. 
Is it harder to do something? It's hard to make a good painting. What's hard is what you put in conceptually. And what she's showing you is, look at how beautiful lightning looks at a storm. I wouldn't want to be out there, but if you're in your house and you see it, it's beautiful. Now, there's a, an, a great artist named Walter de Maria that did a very famous piece called Lightning Fields, and many people get married there. And he did this um, of, of looking at lightning fields. So all these images that you're seeing are telling you something else that she finds interesting. And that is to me what makes the show so great. Now- Wait, one more question about her art, which is she paints yeah. in a way that you can see the canvas. Yes. What, st what yes. statement is she making then? Oh my God. She does not want to do what one of my favorite artists in the world, and I showed you in the beginning, Visha Selmans, I think is a true genius. She sands the surface over and over again because she wants you to feel it's very real. These are about the fact that they're on canvas. So every serious artist thinks through what he or she or they are trying to convince the viewer of. I'm so excited that you like the work. We got to get to the next show. And I'm happy you loved it. I love the show. So now we're going to come to Sam Falls. Very interesting show. Very interesting video. And I did these three artists in a row. They were happened to be on the same ga uh, uh, space, but I, I wanted them next to each other. And I, on purpose, showed them that way. Now, you all know the Hammer Museum. I love the Hammer. So now we're going to see the show that was in the Hammer. The Inyo one was the roughest night because the winds were like 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. And I'm up all night working and then I sleep in the morning. You enter this different world where it's almost like an abyss where the wind is so loud and I'm so focused on this one thing and it's pitch black everywhere, just my headlamp. It's, it's kind of like being at a concert for a long time, just the effect on your ears, but then also just like total blackout. That one was for sure the wildest. I had gotten to a certain subject matter of using nature as a site-specific indicator and an index to a place and then taking away the elements of a camera or a printer or the darkroom ended up using the sun and then the rain as the tools essentially and that's something that everyone can connect to. Basically I find a swath of land and move the plants or rocks from that area, put down the canvas, and put the plants back on it, and do that kind of all during the day. And as the sun goes down, I spread the pigment over the landscape arrangement. As the dew sets, it catalyzes the dry pigment. I take that off and do it all over again. And so you have this kind of depth of field with the sharper images that were done second. The whole layout was designed for the state of California. Here at the top of the stairs is the most northern part, which would include the most northern forests, like Six Rivers, Klamath. It cuts over there to Modoc, and then moving down into the Sierras, and then onto the main wall would be Los Padres, San Bernardino, Angeles, and Cleveland. They are, it's definitely legible, which is really cool. When you see it all together, you do get a feeling of diversity. The number of national forests in California is one of the things that drew me here and one of its like major assets. And so now as they're being less and less protected and burning, it's a way of actually not just representing them, but kind of preserving them. So the reason I wanted to show you this third, do you realize he's like a combination of the first two artists? So when I give a lecture, I am very conscious of that. So I wanted you to see the first artist was purely political. Second artist is giving you a teeny little experience. And this artist is showing you the juxtaposition. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about this is he's using the sun and dew. I don't know if you know the difference between acrylic and oil. Acrylic paint, the binder, is plastic. In oil painting, the binder is oil. In, um, in uh, gum Arabic is for watercolor. So each um, type of pigment has a binder and he is just putting the pigment down and the dew and then he puts a gel medium on top to 
make it stay in the surface. So let's look at the show now. I love the show. Before we get there, two questions. Hammer Museum, you referenced that. Where is that located? People in asked. California. Okay. And the second is so far, the three artists seem very summery. You know, outdoors, I did that summer. On okay. That's Toby Khan. <laughs> that, that's me. I Why did I call this thing for that's what I. I, I convinced Ari to let me teach. I love this program. So I want you to feel like you're getting something specially from you. Oh, Rosa, I'm so happy you're here. Nice to see you again. I, I just saw your face. Um, anyway, I, I wanted it to be for the summer. Yes. Not every show we're seeing today is that. But Mark Bradford's one of my favorite artists in the world. We're seeing him next. I've shown him to some of you before, but this is a different show. But look at this show. I love the installation. And I like that the scale is different. And she all and he also uses ceramic. I hope you like this show. I love this show. I wish I could take you here. It just closed on the weekend. Look at the flowers on the side. And you'll see the I'm going to take you, you'll see the individual pieces, and you'll see. Um, he's using plexiglass, he's using ceramics, he's using all different things. So now you've got a feeling for the basic, now we'll go to the individual pieces. Selected works, the first one says right next to it, right there. Now look at this, this is so gorgeous. And this is when you get smaller, it says underneath it, what is it? It's dry pigment. Can you make that one smaller? Are you had it? I, I, I mean, when you first printed on it, you saw the, or maybe, no, no, that's a beautiful room. We're going to do that. Uh, oh, I thought, it, there it is. There it is. Pigment on canvas. It's 88 by 76 inches. Some artists like things framed. He doesn't. But aren't these beautiful? Anyone who knows Redon, the famous French artist Redon, I, I just like the use of material is just exquisite. Pigment on canvas again. This one's not allowing me to get really close. All right, so I don't I mind. This is glazed ceramics and glass and a brass frame. I don't mind if you're not so close. I like, you, now you're getting closer. I like you seeing it because it looks like there are two skulls in there. To um, uh, skeletons, do you see that? I like how subtle he is. He's a very subtle painter. Let's go to the next. Just sticking to that. So this is not paint, though. He's put some kind of three-dimensional aspect not, to it. Go, no, 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 it's not. Go to the bottom. You'll see it. It's not. Go, go. Wait, go uh, where it shows the material. There it is. It's glazed ceramics and glass. So it's, a, it's not a skeleton, it's some ceramic in there. Oh, is that what you meant? Yes. Those are ceramic pieces stuck on there, but it's not a skeleton. I misunderstood what you meant. Yes. Those are ceramic pieces that are glued to the surface. And then he continues, he puts glass in there and all these different materials. I love this. Now, this looks very Japanese to me. And I like that he has a smaller piece in the middle of a larger piece. And these, I just want you to see, and why did I show you this show? Because these have some small pieces that are as small as the pieces we saw of Dana Power. But what I like is the way that they're gorgeous. On, on the wall in the gallery, you came in and the wall right when you came in you see these little pieces first oh you saw the work in the venice biennale yay you yes wasn't it great there i'm so happy ari i love your class oh go back go back i love that one before that go back one look at that also doesn't that look like it's an ancient rubbing that's what i really love about the work it feels like it's a rubbing lots of comments toby about how much people appreciate you bringing these artists to us. Artists well, I that did most that. So don't. let me tell you what I try and do, Ari. Ask Ari, how many times did I say to you, I want to do one in the summer? I promise you it'll be different than the whole year. That is what I worked. I mean, because these are not going to be shows that would have been up during auction periods. They're just not. 
Yeah, but you also said when you first started doing this that there are no shows in the summer. And then you but then you told me privately things have changed, right? They have. And you know why they've changed? Are you ready for this? COVID. COVID has been great. And and the shows stay up longer. <coughs> the shows are up for three, two months now. This next show that we're going to see, which is my favorite show of the day of a friend of mine. He's not a friend. He's a good acquaintance. Mark Bradford. Um, that's up for two and a half months. I think it's even up for three months. But look at this again. And I also like that this is a circle. Look at how different the way it looks. I'm so happy that somebody had seen this in the Venice Biennale. Right. Most of us, I mean, not many of us are from California, and this art is so Californian. Are we yes, going to be able to see correct. this in California? Yes. Well, he's a Californian artist. But where can we see his art? With oh, with I don't remember which gallery shows him in California. I'll do the homework and I'll let you know. Thank I don't you. know who. But look at this again. So beautiful. Yes, you're very right. Um, a watercolor using salt resin. Um, thank you, uh, um, Rona. Look, that, that's the one I want you to see up close. Look at that. So that's the end of this, uh, of this little thing. So now we're going to go to the next artist. How many of you know, and I, I think I might have shown you his work once, but this is all new work. I don't know if any of you remember. I think in the very beginning when I started teaching, I showed you Mark Bradford because I think he's a true genius. He's a, a um, so let's see him. Now, this video is one of the funniest videos I've ever seen because um, this is Mark Bradford. Um, all right, let's look at that for a minute. Really always use the materials that I use and have really always used have always been paper. The tools of civilization, how we build and destroy ourselves, are the materials that I'm really interested in. And paper is one of the main ways in which information is, is displayed. Paper in itself is simply a bunch of fragments held together by a binder. I always saw it as pigment, dried in a binder and cut into eight and a half by 11 blocks. So just in my head, I thought, oh, well, you just have to wet it so that it can move like paint. What constitutes a painting, sort of, and who, is the, who are the gatekeepers of that? I think that, I'm sure that me being a painter was a very political gesture for me. If you're black and from South Central, you have a lot of like identity stuff that you could just fall right into. And I just thought I was going to do abstract work, but it was going to talk about race and class and culture and all these things, but I was going to do it from an, um, um, an abstraction place, which gave me freedom. And then I was going to look outside. I wasn't going to do this kind of hermetic interior, close the world off, which is historically what we understand abstraction as being. I was going to have relationship with the world and with politics because I was interested in those things. I was really starting to get very interested in the, founda the foundations of our country and the amendments or the Bill of Rights are still what we go to. And interesting enough, it is on paper. I mean, it is one of our historical documents, one of our most important documents are on paper. And also, this, it's, we put paper in the, in, in the photo, photocopier. So it's both precious and not precious at all. It's both protected by security guards and, th and, and shredded. So Amendment 8 is actually in part of the Bill of Rights series. And there's certain fragments that cling to the edges of the composition. Certain words float in and out. They're legible and not legible. They hint. But in some ways, that's how we really do understand the dense documents. We don't we will never fully understand. They're so dense, but we pull and we, we glimmer and we, we dive and, and we, we project onto these documents. And at the time of the Constitution, certain people weren't even human, women didn't have rights. So we move them forward as the country moves forward. We amend what we excluded in a way. What better place than the Smithsonian to have an amendment painting?
it just fits. It makes sense. If you look at what's going on in the media at the moment with, with um, black male bodies and me being a black male and doing an am amendment painting and sitting in the Smithsonian, that's just super layered. Okay. Now, I wanted you to understand this because he is the fourth artist in my little group of four. <laughs> Do you understand why I put these four artists together? I love what he talks about paper. I think paper is so powerful. And he talks about doing it. And let's see a show that's up right now that's just gorgeous. And he collages. Um, he collages paper that he finds on the street and pulls it together. Um, how many of you know? Do most of you know him? I, I'm a big fan of his. All right. So these are. On the ground floor features a series of paintings of Bradford created in 2021 of European tapestry and the relationship of power as symbols of the greatest opulence. And look at the way he's using the surfaces. I find them gorgeous. Very different than his other work. Let's go to eat. That's, you see the animals in there. Now, Early on, let's go to installation views first. All right, you can go. Uh, um, all right, then go to the little arrows. All right, and the little arrows, you'll see. They're showing you different parts of the painting. Um, But you see how articulate they're done, but they're all using paint and paper all stuck together. Go down, go, go down a little further. Oh, you're doing great right there, right there. I want you to see that. Um, so you see that the work is all composed of a lot of paint and glued paper on there. And now you see the scale. That's what I was hoping you would get to. Thank you. You're my hero. Um, and it's called Mixed Media on Canvas. But when you're standing there, you are blown away by the scale. You feel like you can walk right into it and look at the way he uses the color black. And then he now, some of it is put on with pulp paper and some of it is now he's starting to use paint more. And you feel the leopard. Do you see that on the right side with the mouth open and the eye? Thank you, Ari. God, you're so good at this. Um, um, so you feel the depth and you feel it, it's a little scary, but when you're in the space, I'm telling you the truth. I was there seven times. I took every one of my classes. There it was on for quite a while. And you feel like you're getting in there. Now, if anyone says this reminds me of Jackson Pollock, you're not wrong. If it reminds you of Monet, other than the colors, you're not wrong. And look at that leopard when you just see that part of it. So that's the way you get to see the whole thing. Let's go to the next one. Now you'll see them on scale, how they look next to each other. Two-faced, I'm sure you can see what's in there. What I love that they show you is you see the faces, but it becomes abstracted. Um, but you see them in there. They're very ghost figury. Um, now, who do they remind you of? If you say Philip Gustin, very good point. It has a real surface orientation, but his sense of color is very subtle. He doesn't put in too much color. And remember, his earlier work, like in the video, was mainly done with paper. I, I think I told you this, but I, if I, I apologize if I said it to you already. He worked with his mother who did, um, she was a hairdresser and she put those little pieces of um, metal um, uh, in hair. I don't, I'm a guy, I don't use that, you know, to dye your hair. Um, uh, what are those called? Those little squares? Anyone want to put that in the chat? I don't know what it's called, but there's a word for it. Um, Nobody wrote it yet. 
So now you see them up close. There you see it in the game. Oh, that's the piece I wanted you to see. Oh, I love you. Uh, go, go, go back. You just ha now you're walking into there. That's there's a painting right when you walk in the door. Uh, we missed that already. It goes back to it, but you'll see things from up close. That's the piece. You see that? I can't control. It's just a video that they're showing. Oh, on but it's all right. I don't mind. You can see here that he takes um, paper. That's a perfect one to see. He takes paper and then he glues it all together. And now you're walking through the gallery. God, this is fantastic. So you see the scale. It's unbelievable. And you see the way the words, like the one in the Constitution, sometimes he puts words that are in there and sometimes not. And this is a very important show because he's using paint, more paint than he ever did. And the reason they have the woman walking in there, so you see scale. But you can see the paint that has been poured on top of the paper. And he glues the paper down to the surface. So that's why you see it's not smooth. I wish I could have taken you to this show because it's, it's so luscious. And that is different papers that he glues down. So that's why it's not all pigment. So that is like blue paper smushed up, red painter smushed up. I like that word smushed, but. Is that a technical art term? <laughs> so an artist like this, I mean. These are millions of dollars each. Is he going to spend his life painting this way or is he going to change dramatically in his career and go a totally different direction. So he has changed quite a bit. Um, uh, did I show you guys that anyone, Rosa, do you remember, did I show you the um, thing on 60 Minutes about him? No? Oh, I would love to spend a minute. Can we just get the 60, oh, that, look at this. Oh my God, they're so brilliant. That's done with paper, by the way. And that's a whole body so he's playing with what does it mean to be a black man and um he's also gay and he's very tall and he says he wasn't a good basketball player there's some great videos um uh, of him there's another one i wanted you to hear how he makes you know why he did that piece for the smithsonian but there's another amazing one of him on 60 minutes um that tell he tells a great story about himself ari can i bother you can we go to um, him and um, um, that famous um, Anderson Cooper? See if you can go to Anderson Cooper, um, Mark Bradford on 60 Minutes. I'd just love everyone to see it for a minute. Um, and then you're going to watch it on your own later. But I want you to see this because it's so adorable. Um, he is so in love with Mark Bradford and he owns a small piece of his. And I must have sent this out to hundreds of people. Are you able to get it, Ari, or is it too hard? You got it? This is the cutest thing. I love it. Watch this. Start it. Well, watch just a minute, and then I want everyone to promise me, if you like my lecture, watch it on your own later. Mark Bradford is widely considered one of the most important and influential artists in America today. His abstract canvases, which often deal with complex social and political issues, hang in major museums around the world and on the walls of big collectors and some small ones like me. Bradford's art may look like paintings, but there's hardly any paint on them. They're made out of layers and layers of paper, which he tears, glues, power washes, and sands in a style all his own. When he began making art in his 30s, Bradford couldn't afford expensive paint, so he started experimenting with end papers. That That's are what it's called, end papers. Here. He got the idea while working as a hair stylist in his mom's beauty shop in South Los Angeles. He was broke, struggling, and didn't sell his first painting until he was nearly 40. I heard a story that when you sold your first artwork in 2001, you called up your mom. Do you remember what you said to her? I said, girl, I think I found a way out of the beauty shop. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, I think I found a way out of the beauty shop, yeah. 
Yeah, because I had no idea how I was going to stop being a hairstylist because that's really the only thing that I knew. I didn't have a problem with being a hairstylist, but that's all I knew. It's incredible to think that 2001 is when you first sold a work. Yeah. And now... I still sell works. Yeah, <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> I sure do. This is the top. <laughs> His first painting sold for $5,000. Now they can sell for more than $10 million. This new one was bought by the Broad Museum in Los Angeles. They have nine other Bradfords in their collection. All right, I, I have enough. Three. I have enough. I want, this is like a taste. I want you to watch this on your own. If I was good, please watch it. I really love him. But I, the reason I like that so much is, um, uh, uh, what's his name, lives uh, right near SVA, Anderson Cooper. And right after he did that on, on 60 Minutes, I saw him on the street and I said, I love Bradford as much as you do. I just don't own one. He goes, well, eventually, maybe you will. But it was very funny because he's upset and, and he buys a lot of art, but that was a big thing for him. So let's go to the next show now. Francis Stark. We're not going to see the whole thing. All the work in this exhibition is from the last five years, which comes after a career survey. My work has been, you know, early on it was very collage based and works on paper. You and understand what I'm doing today? A lot of collage. Predominantly digital realm. It's kind of a risk for me to just focus on painting because it's not my medium per se is that I want to focus attention without demanding a lot from the audience in terms of like kind of long form durational digital presentations. The exhibition brings together works that were made for different contexts and different exhibitions and then two new works that were made specifically for this space. But when we were setting it up it was super great to see that there were formal motifs or approaches in the way that I made the paintings that became more evident seeing them all together. My paintings probably have the most dialogue with like Ed Ruscha or this kind of hand-painted pop era, but there's also like a really tender attachment that I have to Agnes Martin, who is like directly across the room from from the paintings that I made specifically for this show. So it is exciting to, to see them in this context. I've made a lot of works on canvas that involve transcribing other people's writing. And there is this kind of meditative mood that takes over. And I feel that while I'm not the kind of person who could make the kinds of paintings that Agnes Martin makes, I wanted for the museum goer to be able to access the fact that Agnes Martin also was someone who wrote and she wrote about human experience and consciousness and she wasn't just dealing in abstractions but she was dealing with her spirit and, and the complexity of human emotions and the simple act of transcribing Agnes Martin's words onto a canvas um, in, you know, in with a pencil, you know, that's going to sit like across the room from her actual, you know, pencil lines is something that reflects on my practice in general. In addition to this Agnes Martin's voice, which is kind of front and center in the exhibition, there's also the voice of Ian Svenonius, who's a kind of countercultural figure who wrote this fantastic essay called Censorship Now. The act of me enlarging and magnifying and amplifying that text was not just a kind of painterly act, it was a way to also draw attention to this sort of discrepancy between the value of kind of painted surfaces and the value of intellectual critique. I had this idea to do a kind of double-sided painting and it was not to be 
literally so so it wouldn't be like oh you just look at the painting from that's like hung in the middle of the room no this is like one painting would be on this side of the wall and the other would be on this side of the wall and they would just be two different views the painting that in in the show here is from a cell in an original nancy comic strip and i just was so taken aback by this image i had to paint it but how did i make it mine so you see Nancy's looking into his window and she's looking at his kind of messed up house. What is on the other side of Nancy or where she's looking is this kind of, this is what wasn't Bushmiller and this is what I created with this sort of Edenic nature. And instead of saying whatever she originally said, she's saying, behold man, which is a phrase that appears throughout my work. It's not about saying like, behold man, what a slob. That's not the intention. That image is compelling to me because it speaks to a kind of disintegration of material. Okay, that's where I want to stop. And, and a kind of you said the disintegration of material. So I wanted you to understand this also fits into the group. After this show, we're switching to other things, but I wanted all these artists to relate to. First of all, I wanted somebody asked. Do artists change their work over time? She's a great example of somebody who does. Also, I love the fact that she's using writing in her show, but she actually writes it. Um, and she copies, like, you know, Kusama is in that one over there with the dots. She looks at other artists and she puts everything together um, to make it what she wants. So what's fascinating is she had a friend who had to go uh, into the army to Baghdad and it's about their relationship and it's a very powerful uh, piece um, about the idea of living your life and all of a sudden somebody that you love goes into the army and your whole life changes. Um, so you see um the friend who's got a a a, 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 um, a a protection on on their face and then you see two artists standing in the kusama room so it's a very conceptual piece my favorite her work is when she gives less information sometimes i feel she's i love this piece that piece i'm madly in love with because you see um her body and the book sitting in there but it becomes as if you're entering her mind and you become the body reading the book i think she's a really smart artist and there she plays with um tasteful nude left on read with happy anniversary iraq invasion so it's 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 um how do i say this well Sometimes you can make something very beautiful that's poignant about nudity, and sometimes you can look at things that are more S and M on a computer, but they're both about nudity. Do you, I hope you understand what I mean. In other words, sometimes it's powerful romance, and sometimes it's um, not such healthy sex. Um, and that best of all times with the single match left. I mean, I, I think she's very profound. I admire her work a lot. So you would ask me, are these really collages? They are paintings taken from collages. And she very often puts one side of the painting to be one feeling and the other one in reaction to that. This is a much more disturbing show than any of the other shows. So that's the whole show. It's a beautifully installed show. I hope you liked it. If you didn't, I apologize, but I think she's important to look at. I know some of you go like that, but I had to put it in because she's smart and she's talking about very personal feelings and I didn't want it to only be about prettiness. Now we're going to something that I did for myself. Um, this is Tony Smith. 
This is a great little 11 minute video. You're not going to see the whole thing because I don't have enough time, but I'm showing you three minutes of it to teach you something. Now, I don't know if how many of you know that Tony Smith is Kiki Smith's father. Kiki Smith is now very famous, but her father at one time was, when I went to art school, he was very close to my teachers and he was considered the number one guy on minimalism. He's the cover of Time Magazine, Look Magazine. In the 1970s, he was considered one of the most important sculptures in the world. Let's go to see only the first three minutes of this, but I want you to see it on your own later. All right, I'd love to give them all an exam, but I won't do that because I'm a decent Up person. Work of Tony Smith, which is currently on view at the Pace Gallery through July 26th. Tony Smith is an outdoor minimalist, which is a rare exception within a rare exception. Minimalism itself is an exception from every other art movement that exists. Every other art movement has a frame or a pedestal. It is to mark where the art stops. So art, not art. Art, not art. But the minimalists in the 1960s and 70s had this crazy idea. What if we blurred the frame? What if we made a work that made you notice the wall and the space that you are in as much as the work? Minimalism is an effort to balance an object and the room that it is in 50-50. So a successful minimalist work of art, like Carl Andre, is as much about the sculpture on the floor as it is about the ceiling. A Dan Flavin, who does the sculptures out of fluorescent light tubes, is as much about the light tube as it is about what it's doing to the wall next to the work. In fact, I wrote an article for Design Milk two years ago. I'm putting the link in the description, but I only photographed the adjacent walls of a Dan Flavin. So I went to a Dan Flavin show at David Zwerner Gallery, and I only photographed the walls that did not have a Dan Flavin to prove this point that the effort of minimalism is a balance with the space it is in. So that's the reason that your brain should explode when I say outdoor minimalist, because Tony Smith is not trying to balance his sculpture with the ceiling. He's trying to balance his sculpture with the frickin' sky, with a 40-story building in Manhattan. And so they are huge and they are black and they have aggressive angles only to balance, to fit in this massive environment. So if you take a Tony Smith sculpture and you move it into a space that has a ceiling with pure white walls, you have exaggerated every single feature that was meant only to balance itself with the sky. It's something I call super minimalism. So this is Tony Smith at the Pace Gallery right now. I've seen this sculpture a billion times at Hunter College, but now it feels huge, like enormous, because the gallery has purposefully thrown off the balance of minimalism in a really interesting way. Most museums throw off the balance of minimalism in the wrong direction, like they'll put a work of art next to a Dan Flavin, which prevents you from really appreciating the adjacent wall of light. But in this case, they've done it on purpose to create this complete new view of Tony Smith. It falls under the category of curatorial override. If you're fascinated with that concept and other examples of it, I've put a video above from uh, at least a year ago where I talk about another example of curatorial override. But, he, but here's the way that that show has affected my view of the entire art world. There's a Rembrandt at the Metropolitan Museum of Art painted in 1660. I know this seems like it has nothing to do with minimalism. The light in this painting is from a lamp or a candle. That's what's hitting his forehead. And the, and the people who viewed this painting when it was first made also viewed the work under a lamp or a candle. So when you view this painting right now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art under an electric light bulb, it's the same thing as that Tony Smith. Show. That's where I want to stop. That's what I wanted you to hear. Thank you. So I wanted you to understand that I'm excited to take you to this show of Tony Smith because you never see Tony Smith like this. So my long-winded way for the, that was the break in today's class. Uh, I, the first ones were all about using different materials. Now I'm saying, 
look at what they did. They put a Tony Smith in a gallery where it technically shouldn't be because it should really be outside to see it, but it forces you to look at the materialness of it. You all understand, I love the show and my teachers were obsessed with him. And my favorite story about him was, uh, my teacher was E.C. Goosen. You'll look at that first piece and we'll go down further. And they had dinner together and he had a little, oh, here it is. Are you ready? So excited. I kept this as a little, he had a little index box. I brought it here to show you as the class. And at two in the morning, he called Tony Smith and said, what's the exact size of your box? And he made a huge outdoor sculpture this exact size because he liked the scale of it. So Tony Smith is always interested in the space around the space around the space. Now, I'm telling you, I would not love his work as much as I did if he made this after the computer was invented. Because he did all this stuff that he had to do by hand. He couldn't go on a computer and then say, this is what I want. He had to actually make it. So sometimes he would take like a Rubik's cube and move it off, off size. So that's the Tony Smith's little pieces. Um, it's a beautiful show. It's open until August 18th. So that's like the box. You see that one? I love that. It's a painted black wall. And there is a very famous piece of, uh, of, um, of um, I'll get you his name in a minute, um, um, who did a piece in front of the Holocaust Museum. Um, oh my God. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but Tony Smith did this way before the other artist whose name I can't remember. Solowit. Solowit much later did a black wall like this, but he references Tony Smith. Now, do I think it's a big influence on Richard Serra? Yes, I do. Um, so I think he influenced many, many artists who came later. And that I love. I love that new piece. That was done. Now that, if you can do this on a computer, you can take a regular square and move it. But he did this conceptually. Do you understand what I mean? Now, all you do is take it and you put it into a computer. You go onto Photoshop and you make it happen. I find these works so profound. So that's the installation. It's a beautiful show. And these look almost like gems. All right, I'm watching my time because I'm going to get into trouble. Let's go to the next show. I apologize already now. But you can learn more on your own. Now, this next one I love is called Snail's Gallop. We'll go to the video first. And Ari, I won't get into trouble. We'll show this video first. You're going to love this. Hana, Dul, Se, De, Tasor, Uriga, Tasakormal, Kotchimanan. 또 항상 걷는 거리를 걷고 있지만은 또 자기가 어, 하고 있는 일이 항상 같지만은 상황에 따라서 조그만 변화가 아니라 엄청난 변화도 또 만들 수 있다는 걸 갖다가 보여주는 거죠. 사람이 세상과 더불어 관계되어질 때 반드시 똑같이만 이루어지지 않고. 여러 가지 변화가 생기는 것을 아, 다섯 걸음이라는 이벤트 로지카를 통해서 보여주는 것이죠. 그와 마찬가지로 이어진 삶도 어, 내가 소지하고 있는 내가 평소에 내 호주머니라든가 내가 가지고 다녔던 어, 그 물건을 
전부 다한 선으로 연결을 해가지고 맨 나중에는 그 끝에서 내 신체가 또 연결하는 그런 형태의 이벤트를 보여줬어요. 그것도 역시 내가 의도적으로 뭘 가지고 있으면서 그걸 연결했다기보다 내가 생활하는 내 몸과 또 내가 소지하고 있는 물건들과 내 호주머니 있는 것들. All right, we'll stop here because I'm worried about time. All right. I want them to see the next artist too. I know we only have three more minutes, but you'll understand why. Somebody asked me, why do I found Tony Smith so profound? Because he does think in such a simple way. It's like, and the reason I wanted you to see these three artists, these three artists are their own little world together because um, uh, the artist Lee is using his body and how he makes a mark as the reference. And uh, Tony Smith is using everything he sees and tries to, get you to understand that. Now we'll see this last artist, they all, you'll see how they relate. There's 他死了 九十年代初，我从大自然当中捡了一块石头，然后我在这块石头上水写日记。它呢，慢慢的就成为了我后来的一系列的水写的可能性。Thank you, Ari. I'll get back to every person. Why did I show you these three artists? These three artists are all talking about very minimalist ideas. Um, some of them are more beautiful to look at. Some are more personal to look at. And the first uh, group of artists I showed you, all the work I think was quite beautiful to look at. It was a visual experience. Um, and color was important. Scale was important. You know, we saw bigger things, smaller things. There were many things going on. And I wanted you to understand that not everyone thinks the same. And I had to have a group and a group. So this last group, starting with Tony Smith, was looking at everyday objects. And let's say, saying something like he would look at your cell phone and say, wow. Let's blow that up huge and see what that looks like. And then we went to Lee's work and Lee talked about his body and how he makes a movement and that becomes part of the work. And then Song's work is very much about thinking about how water, how anything can make a mark, but that dries and disappears. And I wanted you to think that in relationship um, to Mark Bradford, or Sam Falls, Sam Falls was using dew and pigment to make things, but it was more visually attractive. Anyway, I feel bad that I'm, I'm really at my end. It's now exactly, I'm two minutes over. Ari, I hope you forgive me, but I wanted to pack so much information in and I'm hoping that all of you enjoyed it. And um, I hope you learned something and that you go back and see the videos. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, everybody. It was another terrific Toby adventure into art. Artists we may have known, artists we probably didn't know. I will share a follow-up with links to everything you just saw and a few more bonus uh, videos like the one of the 60 Minutes. So um, enjoy the last day of July. Go outside, look at nature, maybe the world a little differently now. And uh, wow.
Great art. If you're in New York, I just and you can see it, go see it. I want to just say to you, Ari, I so can never thank you enough for letting me have an audience with such fine people who really pay attention. I, I love it. And um, I learn from teaching. You know what I mean? Like the more information, it makes me think out of my head and try and think of what all of you would appreciate. So um, I thank you so much for being here today and have a great, I will see you after Rosh Hashanah. Shana Tova Mutukai. You should have a year full of health and growth and inspiration. And um, I look forward to seeing you. I talked to Ari. I will be coming out to California for a quick little something so I can see many of the Californians in person. Um, and please, God, I'm going to convince my wife to come as well for something. But I, I look forward to seeing you all. But please, God, right after the holidays, we'll go to the next gallery tour, which will be blockbuster names, because that is when New York becomes very alive. Thank you. Have a Thank good you, Toby. Day. Take Thank care. you, everybody. Bye -bye. Nice to see you all. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Keep cool. Enjoy the summer. Holidays are coming. Hello. Bye.